And look, this is the kind of thing where you have to keep putting in a deposit. You have to keep reminding your spirit because yesterday's manna isn't going to get you there today, is it? What does yesterday's manna have? Worms. Worms. If it's only good for the day, give us this day our daily bread. Give us the bread that we need for today, Lord. Right? Because every morning is how I've been doing it. I try to do it every single morning before I wake up. I'm sorry, when I wake up, before I do anything else. Before I wake up would be a dream, okay? That's what they call that. He'll talk to you in those too. But to start down on your knees, grab the word, make some declarations, have communion, bring communion cups home with you, and have communion at your house. That's called an altar. That's a consecrated place. It doesn't have to be in a big church building. The altar is wherever the presence of God is. And in the New Testament, after the day of Pentecost, after in the second chapter of Acts on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, we then became the temple. So we have an altar, but we can neglect the altar, can't we? And, and that's all I'm saying is ask the Holy Spirit to say, what's the root of my neglect? Where am I feeling disappointed where I trusted you and I felt let down and that caused your stock price to drop? That's how a stockbroker would think about this. And for some of us, our trust in God has been knocked down a few notches because we've trusted him and didn't see it come to pass. So it's like, maybe this doesn't work. And that's called unbelief. And that could be a stronghold. That could become a whole stronghold. And, God, and, and we're told in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 to 5, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the demolishing of those strongholds. And unbelief is a big one. And as you spend time fasting and studying the word and, and just listening to the Lord and worshiping and just, man, there's just so much good worship music out there now, right? You could just put on a playlist on YouTube and it'll, it'll feed you great music, great worship music. That creates an atmosphere. That becomes the altar. This could be in your car in the parking lot when you leave for lunch. Make that your altar. It's not place specific. It's presence specific. And he comes where he's welcomed. And your body is now a temple of the Holy Spirit. Don't defile it. That's what we're told. Don't defile the temple. Holy Spirit wants to live in a holy place. He's a holy spirit. Holy place. That's us. You say, yeah, but look at all the things I've done. Well, amazing, isn't it? In spite of all the things that we've done, he still says, I want to reside with you. Wow. I know the thoughts and plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, plans to flourish you. Those that are planted in the courts of the Lord are like flourishing trees that bear fruit. Blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. He shall be like what? A tree planted right by the rivers of living water. The streams of the river feed you, and you're being fruitful. And you're multiplying for the Lord because he's your priority, right? And, and I'm telling you, I, I don't want to overplay the point, but really, this is what I saw for 30 plus years with my wife, like a, a tenacity to dig in the word, not to do chores first thing in the morning, not to, not to look at the long list of stuff that you have to do. No, God is first. That stuff can wait. This can't. God first. Everything else will fall into place thereafter. And thank you. <laughs> it was a great example. I'm the kind that has to see it, you know. So let's just look at the list, would you? Want to just do that for a minute? And I'm right under those verses. It says, I place boundaries on my thoughts and I guard my heart from temptation. All right, that's another scripture verse. It says, guard your heart for out of it. Come on. Flow the issues of life. Out of your heart, not your head. Out of your heart, flow the issues of life. You need to renew your mind. Be therefore not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But before that, it says, offer yourselves a living sacrifice. Offer your bodies a living sacrifice. That's an altar. Romans 12.1, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, your body, right? And um, you probably heard this line where people said the problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. <laughs> That's our flesh. We don't like to be crucified. Well, Jesus only said, take up your cross daily and follow me. He didn't say minute by minute. <laughs> Did it have to be daily? Couldn't he have said weekly? 
No, he said every day. Mah. Some of you want to leave right now, right? It's gonna, not going to get worse, I promise. So that's my first one. I make a declaration that I'm placing boundaries on my thoughts and I'm guarding my heart from temptation because every one of us can face temptation. Jesus faced temptation just like we do. In every way, he was tempted just like we are but without sin. How great is that? So as big as that temptation looks, and I've had plenty of people tell me, I just couldn't help myself. It was inevitable. I heard one of my cousins tell me. I said, no, it wasn't inevitable. That you're listening to the wrong station. Tune in to God. You got the devil station on. Second one, I place boundaries on my personal behavior. Now you got to be careful because this could get legalistic, couldn't it? Like, I don't do this. I don't do that. Women shouldn't do this. Men shouldn't do that. Well, there's a certain amount of wisdom in that. What we watch on, on social media, on television, how we are occupying our minds really matters to God. And you have no excuse these days because there's every available thing for free on your phone that's godly. The word of God is free. Everything. Anybody want to know resources? I'm happy to tell you. There's so many resources. It's not like you have, don't have any other thing to do. You don't have to listen to Howard Stern. Okay? Thank God is right. But guys can just get a little lazy sometimes. They're like, ah, oh, no big deal. Yeah, it's a big deal. Garbage in, garbage out. All right, so then the third one is I place boundaries on my public behavior, too, and where I draw the line with other people. Anybody here work for a big corporation, you know that you have to watch videos that, that tell you where your boundaries are and what you're allowed to say to other people and what you're not allowed to say. Anybody have a problem with that? Too bad. <laughs> too bad. You want to work here? These are the rules. You don't like it? Too bad. That's, our, you, that's part of your condition of working here. And it's really getting a little tough, isn't it? Like you can't even tell somebody, wow, you, that, that color looks really nice on you. Because that could be perceived as being flirtatious, right? But, you know, we, we did this to ourselves. Just remember that, okay? We did this to ourselves. Guys just violated that so many times that so many people got hurt that they're, you know, the answer that they've come up with is we're just going to limit what you can say or you'll get fired. Where if they just got saved, they wouldn't want to say that. So better to work on the heart, right? So that should be what we're telling them. And then I also place my boundaries on my relationships in that I have to be willing to speak the truth in love when needed. That seems to be a little bit lost on today's church. That if to love somebody means that they should do whatever they want to do. If you love them, you'd let them do what they want to do. But that's a violation of scripture. In, in Wall Street, they say that's a prohibited transaction. <laughs> Like, I'm not allowed to buy the stock before I tell you what the price is, because that's cheating, right. see? And, and to, for you to see sin and not call it out is a problem, but if you call it out with a hammer, that's a problem too. So you have to call it out, but you have to speak truth in love. That takes about 50 years to get well, to, you know, to do that well. But keep practicing, because to not address it is not good either, is it? All right, I'll leave that one alone. And then I also place boundaries on my physical location, right? I, I, I'm not going into bars at 2 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Amen. But you could say, oh, I'm newly saved, and that's where my friends are. Well, bring an older Christian with you. If you're going there to witness, fine. But if you're going to open yourself up to all that stuff, like maybe you're just not strong enough yet to do that, just gauge where you're at if, if it's appropriate for you to be there, and if it's if it's for evangelism, wait outside. You get my point, right? Use a little wisdom. Don't walk up to the edge thinking, oh, no big deal. I don't have a problem in that area. I don't know if you remember Bob Dylan, but when Bob Dylan got saved, it was legit. This guy's a huge songwriter, so famous in the 60s and 70s. He wrote beautiful Christian songs, but they rushed him. They just didn't give him time to be discipled and to grow and to mature, and he backslid in a really short time. But if he had just been properly discipled, it would have had such a positive impact on the world. Um, I'll keep going. Um, I'm, I'm just saying, these are just the things I've been doing lately. This can change. You have your own. Come up with your own. But when you make the declaration, say it out loud. Don't just think it. I place boundaries on my physical location today, where I live, where I work, where I visit, where I'm not going to go. And I, I'm willing to honestly self-assess, all right? That's kind of a packed-in little phrase there. I'm going to honestly self-assess. I'm going to hold up the mirror and say, what part do I have to own 
in this situation. And as, as the Bible says, as much as it's within my power, I have to pursue peace with all people. If they don't want to respond, that's up to them. But I have to do my half of that equation, right? Not easy to do, is it? And I'm also inviting feedback, and I'm willing to make difficult course corrections. Man, you could spend a whole day on that one, couldn't you? Honestly self-assess, invite feedback from other people, and make difficult course corrections when they give you good advice. And then I'm, uh, I'm willing to live with an eternal perspective that I'm bound for glory and I'm occupied with the Father's business in the earth. That's our mission, isn't it? Right? They said about Jesus, did somebody else bring you food? He said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. I actually get nourishment by being occupied. That's what that says. I'm going to be occupied with my father's business. That's how I get fed. And that's when the anointing comes, right? When like Trisha referred to it before, Elijah was challenging the prophets of Baal. And he said, let's build an altar. And if your God is real, let's see. Let's put it to the test. And there was just a series of sin in the kings of Israel and Judah that caused this terrible problem that Ahab and Jezebel were, were the kings at the time. And the sin was so bad, Elijah said, you know what, enough. Let's have a challenge. Build an altar. And they didn't get any results, as you know. And what happened to Elijah's altar? Pour more water on it. This is during a drought, by the way, just so you know. During a drought... Pour more water on the altar. Pour more. Get a trench around it. Fill the trench with water. And then he said, Lord, come down and show them your power. Boom. Fire fell. Dried up all that water. Consumed the offering. And that's what God does for us. Amen. I'm not teaching on that today, but we will get to it. And that's the theme of that conference that I showed you. My theme is just the blessings of obedience. And, excuse me, it's totally tied in because... This is a very complex set of instructions on how to live our life, right? There's a lot of nuance in here. You can take it the wrong way if you're not careful. You can read a little piece of it and forget that it's not part of a bigger story. And people have done that, and they've turned it into a, a hammer, and they've whacked people. No, Jesus is our example. He's the perfect human. The Spirit of God is what gets us there, and the Father's love is what got us in and keeps us going, okay? What a perfect combination of the three things that we need. So I want to read um, that, that Leviticus portion of scripture. I know we just went through the declarations. There's more there in that next section, but for sake of time, I'm keeping an eye on the clock here. Ready? You see where I am on your handout, Leviticus 26? You don't have to read it with me, but just follow along. It says, you shall not make idols for yourselves, neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves. Can we stop there for a second? Does that remind you of anything else in the Bible? Yeah. What else? Ten Commandments. Yes, have no other. But this is, this is Leviticus 26, so it's a little different. But it's very similar in wording, isn't it? You're not going to make idols for yourselves. Does that apply to us today? Well, how many people are thinking about that? Probably not enough. Are there idols in my life? And, and I wouldn't think it was when I first look at it. But, you know, I'm in the finance business, and if you want to know what people value, look at their checkbook and look at their credit card statements. It doesn't matter what they tell you they value. That Where their treasure is is where their heart is. So I, all I have to do is get permission to get their bank statements and their credit card statements, and I know a lot about them. One lady, I, I remember doing this when I was new in the business, and um, I said, man, is there a mistake here? You have so many film, you know, you're developing so much film. Like, are they, are they ripping you off? Like, are they double charging your credit card? She said, no, I'm a model. <laughs> it's what I do for a living. I have to develop a lot of film. It's, it's, it's part of my career. Well, that made sense to me after I knew that. In fact, I knew it beforehand, but it wasn't making the connection, right? But see, this is the point, that God's looking at her heart and saying, what do you really love? And if it's not me, it could be an idol. Tear it down. That's what it says. No idols. Neither a carved image nor a sacred pillar shall you rear up for yourselves, nor shall you set up an engraved stone in your land to bow down to it. For I am. Is that what it says? What's his name? I am. I am the Lord your God. I am the one that you bow down to. There's no other gods before me. I'm the one. You want the blessing? You got to be obedient. You can't live in a watered down version of the word. This is a big challenge, isn't it? That's why I should pray in the morning. 
So I should start my day and not get distracted by other things and say, I know what my true north is today. I probably won't hit it a thousand percent every single time, but I'm trying. I'm, I'm going to crucify my flesh today, Lord. I'm going to live according to your word because I want the blessing. It's hard enough to live life without the blessing of the Lord. I'm not going to purposely do something that's going to bring a hammer down on me for disobedience. Amen? It's not a hard thing to do, though. He it wouldn't be fair, would it? Like if God was going to set down a bunch of rules and it's going to be too hard to do, it wouldn't be fair. He wouldn't be a good father. And if you needed an IQ of Einstein to figure it all out, that wouldn't be fair either, would it? He came in a manger, not a Hilton. When he was born, it was at the lowest rung of the ladder. It was almost outside in a field. Like, forget the Hilton, right? He'll meet you wherever you're at. Everybody has access to the kingdom of God if they're willing to come in. But this is a really important thing. And then he says, verse 3, if you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and perform them, then I will give you rain in its season. The land shall yield its produce, and the trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing will last until the time of vintage, and the vintage will last until the time of sowing. You shall eat your bread to the full and dwell in your land safely, and I will give peace in the land, and you shall lie down, and none will make you afraid. I will rid the land of evil beasts, and the sword will not go through your land. You will chase your enemies, and they shall fall by the sword before you. Five of you shall chase a hundred, and a hundred of you shall put 10,000 to flight. Your enemies shall fall by the sword before you, for I will look on you favorably and make you fruitful, multiply you, and confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat the old harvest and clear out the old because of the new. Hang on to that one, man. That's a big one. You're going to have so much, you're going to have to clear out the old to make room for the new. I will set my tabernacle among you. That's an altar. That's your personal life as an altar. I will set my tabernacle among you. My soul shall not abhor you. I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. I have broken the bands of your yoke and made you walk upright. Celebrate the Lord right now. That's true. That's true. But it's conditioned on verse 3. Starts with two little letters, I, F, if, right? All those amazing promises. But, yeah, it's like, okay, that's the, that's the positive result, but you got to do your part. Like I said, if you had to be Einstein to figure this out, it wouldn't be fair. That's not who God is, right? You've heard the story of Jerry Kaufman in the Bronx in New York City. He was a heroin addict, teenager. He was about to die. He's walking past a Spanish church. He doesn't speak Spanish. He goes in and he gets saved. <laughs> he didn't even know what they were saying. But the power of God was so strong. The presence of God was so strong. He got so convicted, he got saved. And then he became a pastor. And then he planted other churches. And he was bringing prostitutes in off the street while they were working and making a place for them and say, you don't have to get cleaned up first. Come in and God will take care of it and you're not gonna wanna do this anymore. So it took somebody that had been on that bottom rung to understand the mindset of the people. Let's not get so high-minded that we forget that's where his heart is and just keep going back and reminding people of the goodness of God. We all have different role to play. This is a really high goal for me is to receive every one of those blessings that we just read in those 10 or 11 verses. Turn it over, okay? You liking this so far? All right, it's a little tool for you to use. Come up with your own, though. You can, you can have your own promises that are real to you. Search. Be a, be a treasure hunter of Scripture in the Word. Look for those treasure verses. And write down as many promises as you can find. Put your name in there. It was just whatever. I'm not going to go there. Forget it. <laughs> Cancel that thought. The top says, I deny myself, take up my cross daily, and I follow Jesus. Luke 9, 23. I love my enemies. i got to say that about five times to get it through. That's Matthew 5, 44. I give no place to the enemy. Ephesians 4, 27. I pray always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Now, that's hard to do, isn't it? You say, yeah, but I have a job. I drive a bus. How can I pray while I'm driving the bus? You better pray when you're driving a bus around here. There's no job that you shouldn't be including the Lord in while you're doing the work. You should be asking him for shortcuts. 
Lord, you already know the answer to this thing. What's the right way to handle it? You know the person I have to talk to, and they can be a little squirrely sometimes. What should I say to remove the squirrel? <laughs> I mean, he was so good at this. He was so good at coming up with the right answer on the fly, right, that we don't ask, or at least I wasn't asking nearly enough. He loves us. He's a good father. He's right there. You ask, he's a very present help. He's right here wanting to help you in that time of trouble. And then I rejoice always. I pray without ceasing, and in everything I give thanks. I study to show myself approved. I refuse to sin in my anger. I refuse to let the sun go down in my anger. I hide the word of God in my heart so that I will not sin. It's a big mouthful, isn't it, so far? It's a good reminder, though. I flee from sexual immorality. I bless those who curse me. I pray for those that despitefully use me. I take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. There's something about your spirit man hearing your voice say it that makes it stick in there more than if you just read it. Because if you're reading it, you could be daydreaming, right? You could be drifting a little bit. But to speak it out loud, you have to be concentrating on what you're reading. And then later in the day, you'll hear yourself say it. Anybody remember Corey Ten Boom in the hiding place? And they had a morning Bible study every day. And, and Corey was like the grouchier of the two sisters. Betsy was the happier, like more joy-filled one. But Corey is the one that wrote the book. So you're hearing it from Corey's side. And she's letting you know that she was grouchy. They were in a prison camp. You know, like if anybody had a reason to be upset, it might be her. So that morning, the verse was, give thanks in all things. So they get into a new set of barracks, and there's fleas in the barracks. And Corey is like, there's no way I could thank God for fleas. All right, that's where I draw the line. This is not from God. <laughs> and Betsy said, no, it's from God, because he said, give thanks in all things. You just can't see what the blessing is. About a week goes by, and they realize the guards aren't coming into their barrack. And because Betsy was there while Corey was out, and, and she's smiling when, when Corey comes back that day and says, hey, remember that? complaint you had about the fleas? Well, the whole reason the guards aren't coming in here is because of the fleas. So even in the fleas, God had a purpose for that thing. You just couldn't see it. Give thanks. Man, convicting, isn't it? To see everything through the lens of the scripture and the lens of God and the lens of optimism, faith, in spite of what you're seeing with your eyes, just don't feed that unbelief, that stronghold of unbelief. It'll kill you. I could read them all, but you guys know how to read, so you could, you could read the rest of these. There's a couple more things I want to do, okay? Good, it's 11.55. Look at Romans 12. If you broke this down, I don't know, I, I didn't count, but there's probably 30 different pieces of instruction just in these little 13 verses, maybe. So let love be without hypocrisy. Think about that. That's one right by itself. My love has to be without hypocrisy. Not easy, is it? You get convicted by Holy Spirit when you start to say something that's hypocritical, right? I had a, a bad temper when I was younger, and the, the, the counselor called my family, and I got home, and uh, my father had a really bad temper. And, and he said, well, what's your problem? Why are you getting angry? I said, well, you get angry all the time. Like, what's the problem? I'm, I'm just doing what you taught me. I didn't even know that. And he got mad. And I knew he would get mad. You get the point? You can't tell somebody to quit smoking while you're puffing. <laughs> so love, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. That's a tough one, isn't it? Abhor what is evil because we're filled with love. We're filled with the love of God. We know God wants to love people, but if they're involved with evil stuff, you have to love the sinner but hate the sin probably one of the hardest things to do. But Holy Spirit will let you. He'll give you that ability. To do. Jesus did it. Just study the Gospels and see how he did it. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. And in honor, give preference to one another. Don't lag in diligence. Be fervent in the Spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. <laughs> Continue steadfastly in prayer. Distribute to the needs of the saints. Be given to hospitality. Bless those who prosecute, persecute you. Bless and don't curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Wow, I'm getting tired. This is hard. If I really try to do every one of those things in there, and this is just one little letter from Paul to the Christians saying this is what it means to live your life as a Christian. 
that you're modeling Jesus as much as you can. You're taking on his character and you're integrating him into your life. There's blessing in the obedience. And that sounds selfish, but it's not because the blessing on your life is what causes other people to want to, to know this Jesus. There's so much of a shine of, of the illumination of God on you that that draws them. When you're walking in the blessing, other people can see it. And they, that draws them. That makes them jealous to want what you have. And, and that's not the reason to do it. The reason to do it is because you want to be an obedient son and daughter. And you're doing this out of love for the Father. He loved me enough to save my life. How can I not give my life back to him? All right. So can we just look at a couple of the scriptures up here? Go to the Leviticus one. Um, no, I already did that one. Sorry. Go to 1 Samuel. Uh, 1 Samuel 22. And a lot of you probably know this, but it's just a good reminder. And, you know, just position yourself on December 29th as we're about to cross over into 2020. And the theme for the year is declaration. The decade of the decree. We're going to speak it out loud. We're not going to just read it and think about it. We're going to say it. So, men, warm up your voices. Don't be those guys that just grunt, you know? Like, start using more of your vocal cords. 1 Samuel 15. What is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? What do you say, church? Obedience. obedience. Listen. Obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as the sin as witchcraft, is as sinful as witchcraft, sorry, and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. Can we do that one again? Stubbornness as bad as... Why did he have to preach this today? Because <laughs> uh, it hit me. That's bad. That's an idol. That's violating the altar. That's just as bad as what we read in Leviticus. Don't raise up a graven altar. If I'm stubborn, I'm, I'm being stiff-necked. That's like witchcraft. Uh -huh. Submission is better than offering. Rebellion is like worshiping idols. So because this is Samuel speaking to Saul, because you have rejected the commandment of, command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. That's pretty sobering, isn't it? Okay, so not meaning to, to bring you down in any way. I'm just saying this matters. This stuff really matters. Yes, I'm saved. Yes, I'm going to heaven when I die. He doesn't take my salvation back from me. But I want to live a flourishing life. I want to walk in the blessing. I don't want to live that watered down halfway there life. And then think on these things. This is from the Passion Translation. I, just another one of those great verses to... to Ponder in your mind. I like it in, in the passion.